All right, hi everyone. Welcome to Google I.O. and the cloud session at Google I.O. I am Urs Hölzli. I run technical infrastructure at Google. And let me start by talking a little bit about the history of our infrastructure. Uh, we started building our internal infrastructure a long time ago, over a decade ago. And we had to start building it because there wasn't really any infrastructure that scaled to the demands of our workload, to search, to Gmail, to apps, to everything. And last year, I invited Stephen Levy to come by and have a look at our infrastructure. And he, wrote, he called it the mother of all clouds, which is kind of true because we've been working on it for 14 years. So for 14 years, we've been building the largest, fastest, and most cost-effective infrastructure in the world. Uh, for over a decade, we've been building our servers, we've been building our data centers, we've been building our networks. You use this infrastructure every day, probably, because you use Google products, and so you know how fast and reliable it is. And building such an infrastructure is really a huge task, and sometimes it's a huge headache. But for me and my team, it's a huge challenge, and that's what makes us get up in the morning, come to work, to go and make that infrastructure even better. And with the Google Cloud infrastructure, you can now use that same infrastructure for your own applications. But before we get into that details, let me just show you a few pictures of how this actually looks. Here's what looks uh, like a room of servers, but it's actually from our networking room. Our networking rooms are larger than some other people's server rooms. Here's another look at the networking room where we connect our data centers together. Here's a row of servers, each server built by us and optimized for performance and cost. So maybe they're not pretty, but they're fast and very effective. Here's a row between, here's the inside of a server row. So on both sides, you see the back of the servers. They push their hot air into this plenum where it gets uh, cooled again. Here's a server room in Finland where we converted a paper mill into a data center. And here's a mechanical room in one of our data centers where all the cooling water comes together. Blue pipes deliver the cool water to the floor. Red uh, is the warm water coming back. And here's some cooling towers in a data center. We use cooling towers uh, where we evaporate uh, water in a, uh, to cool our data centers in an environmentally friendly way. In fact, we spent a lot of effort to make our data centers in our cloud as environmentally uh, um, um, you know, compatible as possible. So we've been leaders in data center efficiency, for example. Uh, our data centers use only half as much of energy as normal, average data centers. And that's good not just for the environment, it's also good for you, because less overhead means less cost and we pass these savings on to you in lower prices. We're also the first internet company that's gotten ISO 14000 environmental certification for our standards at the data centers. And we're proud to have been the cool IT leader uh, at, in the Greenpeace leaderboard for two years in a row now. So when you run your applications in the Google Cloud, you know you're not just getting great performance, but you also get great environmental uh, performance. And we're continuing to build this infrastructure. Just in the last 12 months, we announced data center expansions in the US, in Europe, in Asia, and in South America uh, for over $2.9 billion. So clearly, we see a lot of growth uh, in demand for our services. But we also wanted to make sure there's enough room for the growth of your services. We also run one of the world's largest networks. We're the only company that's not an ISP to own and operate submarine cables, for example. So here you see some pictures of the Unity cable uh, where we uh, organized a consortium to build a new cable between the US and Japan that today serves uh, several terabits of capacity between those two places, just in, just in time for, for Gangnam style, I, I guess. <laughs> um, so our network spans the globe. And it includes one of the largest, if not the largest, CDN. And we peer with virtually every major ISP worldwide. 
So we can hand off your bits to the end user ISP in one step and therefore have the best performance and speed. So, you're knowing, so you know that you're not just getting the best performance inside the data center, you're also gonna get the best performance between data centers and to your users. And our network is not just big, it's also one of the most advanced networks you'll find. Uh, well, today, many are talking about introducing software-defined net networking. We have been running a software-defined backbone for over two years. Our OpenFlow Power backbone, which you see here, connects our data centers and provides much better performance and cost than our previous backbone. And so when you run your application on a Google Cloud, you'll benefit from that backbone as well. And of course, we work not just on physical infrastructure, but also on software infrastructure. And I'm especially proud that we can really claim the best track record of any company in building infrastructure software. Here's just a few examples from the last uh, decade or so. In, two, in 2002, we built GFS, the Google file system. And GFS was really the first file system to scale to data center uh, size. We had to build it because no existing file system could really handle our workload. Remember, to build web search, you have to first build an index. And to build an index, you have to store your own copy of the web in a file system. So that's why you built uh, GFS, which later, a few years later, inspired uh, Hadoop uh, file system, HGFS. But we're not actually using GFS anymore. We moved on to Colossus, which is, which is its uh, much more capable successor. And that's what's actually powering a cloud storage today and also pretty much any other storage um, at Google. Now, why did we retire what arguably was one of the world's most successful and most capable file systems? It's because we're building for the future and we wanted a file system that was more capable, a file system that can handle workloads and storage pools at least 100 times bigger than GFS, a file system that has higher availability with multi-master uh, and fully distributed uh, directory, a file system that understands Flash, you know, and so on. And we also learned a lot of things in the 13 years since we started using GFS. And all of these things have flown, uh, flowed into, into Colossus, and therefore we ret retired uh, GFS. For another example, 2004, we created MapReduce, which of course inspired Hadoop and the whole big data industry. Uh, similarly here, we have a lot of MapReduce still running inside the company, but we're not actually using MapReduce anymore. We use Flume, which makes it much easier to construct sort of large pipelines of MapReduces. In 2006, we created Bigtable, which is probably the world's most scalable NoSQL uh, infrastructure, and very likely the most battle-tested NoSQL infrastructure there is. Almost everything at Google uses Bigtable. So Gmail, web indexing, uh, G+, if, you, if they use a, a NoSQL uh, system. So pretty much everything runs on Bigtable today. But of course, we're also working, we're already working on making it obsolete. And uh, last year we talked about Spanner, which gives you uh, a similar, uh, um, a similarly scalable and similar performance system, but with uh, transactional consistency. So I hope you're catching my point, right? Not just once, but several times, we wrote a industry-leading system decades ago, only to retire it because it wasn't good enough anymore and we wanted to, to get something even better. And so we've been around the block, you know, more than once, and that's what you actually see in the quality and the performance of the public cloud infrastructure, even though it's just you know, not even a year old. So we spent the last 14 years building these great systems with the scale, performance, and value that we needed internally, and now we're making them available to you. In fact, in just the less than 11 months since I was here at Google I.O. Uh, announcing uh, our cloud, we've launched over 160 improvements to pretty much all 
of the systems in the cloud. Now let's take a look at what our users have done with uh, that cloud. Uh, MapArt break, uh, broke the minute sort uh, for only $1,200 using Compute Engine. The previous world record was held by custom hardware costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. So even in a pre-release uh, software, we're delivering world record performance. Snapchat, probably one of the largest, uh, fastest growing consumer services out there, is delivering over 150 million snaps per day on Google App Engine. Songpop scaled to over 60, uh, to over 80 million users on a cloud platform, one million daily users using App Engine and data store and cloud storage. Scalar, all right. The performance of, of, of Compute Engine let Scalar dream about things that they can't, couldn't dream about before, even though they've been providing systems management software for many other cloud providers. The simplicity of our infrastructure lets Udacity focus on doing courseware rather than being a sysadmin or dealing with their, you know, administering their systems. And for those of you watching from Europe or here from Europe, you'll know that the Concours d'Eurovision is one of the largest TV events in the world, a uh, song contest. And just two days ago, the semifinals uh, ran and the software for the user participation in those semifinals was written by uh, our two partners, Scalar and Grand Centrix. They delivered, they delivered 50,000 requests per second at really great uh, and consistent latency on Compute Engine. So our customers are using really all parts of our infrastructure. Let's take a quick step back and look at that. Our cloud platform is a comprehensive integrated platform with compute, storage, and application services. An extension of our internal infrastructure with strong connections to other Google services and APIs. And so as thousands of Google's engineers improve this infrastructure for Google, you will benefit from those improvements as well. So you can use what we use. So you can build your software and run your business in the same place that we do with the same performance, scale, and value that we built for ourselves. So now that you've seen our past and our vision, um, let me show you a few things that we're announcing today. Let's start with Compute Engine, because many of you want and need access to raw VMs. That's important. We announced Compute Engine a year ago, and we rolled out a ton of improvements since then. Now today, the standard unit of measure for compute is an hour, regardless of how much time you actually use. So if you have a 15 minute job that's done after 15 minutes, you still pay for 60 minutes, which increases your actual cost by four times. So just think about that. Imagine making a 15 minute phone call and then you get charged for a full hour. Makes no sense. And starting today, you won't get overcharged like that on Compute Engine. We're, in, we're introducing sub-hour billing, which means that you have the value and the flexibility that you want from the cloud. And specifically, we're billing in one minute increments with a 10, minimum, a 10 minute minimum. So you really pay only for what you actually use. And sub, thank you. So sub-hour billing really changes how you can think about building your application. So suppose you have a MapReduce and it's running for an hour and that's too slow. And suppose you want to make it complete in 15 minutes. Well, it's easy. Just add four times as many servers. You get charged for four times as many, as many servers, but only for 15 minutes. So you end up paying basically the same thing as before, yet your job runs four times faster. In other cloud providers, you'd have to pay a four times premium for that extra speed up, which really doesn't make it a viable choice. So 
the, the uh, sorting world record that you saw before, now instead of $1,200, only costs $200. So that's really value, you know, performance and scalability all in one place. But sometimes you need only a little bit of VM, you know, maybe for, for, for testing or for an application that just doesn't need a lot of CPU. So we're introducing smaller micro instances they are very cost effective ways to handle these workloads. But unlike other providers' small instances, these instances still have predictable performance, not just best effort performance. So just as sub hour billing lets you scale up a workload, these instances let you scale it down with predictable performance. We also have adva advanced routing that lets you connect your on premise infrastructure with an encrypted VPN to the cloud. Very easy to use, very straightforward. Now you can combine, you, you can have applications that really span uh, both infrastructures. Persistent disks are a big portion of the value in the infrastructure, right? You have, you want to attach persistent VMs to, uh, persistent disks to your VMs. And our persistent disks are limited to one terabyte, which even though it matches what other providers have, isn't really enough. And so you ask to make them bigger. And you were right, right? The one terabyte isn't really big enough. So starting today, you're gonna have 10 terabyte uh, persistent disks. And I'm especially proud that we were introducing this, you know, 11 months after we started, after we first announced uh, Compute Engine, where other leading providers after seven years, have not managed to have persistent disks larger than one terabyte. So speaking of storage, if, you use, if you've been using App Engine, you loved Data Store, because Data Store is basically big table, a NoSQL Data Store that is very, very scalable and very, very easy to use. So the App Engine high replication Data Store uh, has been incredibly popular this data store today serves over 4.5 trillion transactions per month. That's trillion, not billion. So it's been incredibly successful. It's twice the load that it handled uh, less than uh, 11 months ago at Google I.O. And now you can use this data store from anywhere as a service, the Google Cloud data store. So whether you build your application on App Engine or on Compute Engine or elsewhere, you can access this data store. And because it's NoSQL, it has fast query response time, no matter whether you have a 10K row table or a 10 million row table. So you can use it from any language and uh, from anywhere. Um, speaking of App Engine, as you know, App Engine has been around for a number of years and provides a scalable, very easy to use, managed way to build applications without the hassle of managing servers. It now has over 3 million active applications, or so active running applications, making it one of the top Google services. And it has thriving communities around Python, Java, uh, Go, but it's missing one of the most popular languages on the web, one that, pop, that, that powers three quarters of all websites. Well, starting today, PHP developers can get the benefits of App Engine. So, so with App Engine, this isn't like your existing PHP stack. So with App Engine, you don't have to manage your PhD, uh, PHP uh, stack. We patch it and manage it for you. And because it's apps, App Engine, if your site gets no traffic, it costs you nothing. But if your site gets a lot of traffic, we can scale it up fast. And by fast, I mean fast. We scale up new instances in fractions of a second, not in minutes. And these instances are not shared. They're securely isolated. Static caching is built in. The data you store is automatically replicated uh, between multiple data centers. So this isn't your daddy's PHP server. In fact, just this weekend, literally this weekend, we helped uh, someone port their existing PHP website uh, to 
App Engine PHP because they were uh, anticipating a flash crowd, which in fact uh, did happen. It took only a few hours to port the site, including uh, turning on PageSpeed uh, service. And the result was that they had a highly scalable site where a cold page load was four times faster than before. So PHP has never been easier to use and run. Speaking of App Engine, still, a lot of you write large applications on App Engine. And we've made it much easier now to have such large applications because you can build modules inside your applications. And these modules logically separate your code. They let you develop with independent teams. And you can, at a fine-grained level, uh, control the versioning, the ACLs, the updates, the quotas, and so on of these different modules. And in fact, you can use different languages for these different modules, all in the same application. And they all share the same uh, backend uh, data stores. So writing large applications in App Engine has never been easier than, uh, never been easier. All right, well actually, it can get even easier. As you saw in the keynote uh, this morning, we're making it even easier to run, uh, to write mobile backends. Many of you already are using the, the Google Cloud as a backend for mobile applications. And with the tools you saw this morning in the Android, uh, in, in the keynote, we're making it even easier for you to interface with your backend and to generate a lot of code for it. You'll see that later in this, uh, uh, you'll see it live uh, later in this talk. Uh, but we know that some of you actually don't, write, don't want to write any code. So we also introducing the mobile starter kit, which is literally a no server code solution. You get a backend, a mobile backend, with push notifications and authentication, and you ha don't have to write any code. Well, you do have to write code, namely the code for your client. That's the code you want to write, right? No overhead. The cloud really doesn't get easier than this. Finally, last but not least, we know that a lot of you care about security, and in fact, a lot of organizations require their infrastructure to be certified. So I'm happy to announce that we have ISO 27K, uh, yes, 27K security certification for all of our cloud, compute engine, app engine, and storage. And this is just one example of our commitment to security, and you'll hear more about that uh, later uh, this year. But now let's see this cloud platform in action. So Greg uh, will show you how easy it is to build an application and by mixing and matching the different components of our infrastructure. Greg. Thanks, Urs. As Urs mentioned, I'm gonna spend the next 25 or so minutes building out an application that uses some of these new features of the cloud platform that we announced today. And because this is a developer conference, we're gonna spend the next 25 minutes looking at code. Uh, I also wanna introduce Brian Lynch, a solutions architect on the cloud platform, who's gonna help us as we go through this. So let me start by describing to you what this application that we're gonna build is. There we go. We're going to build a video sharing site for IO attendees. Um, this is gonna have a site that allows us to upload videos, view videos, comment on them, um, and it's gonna have a mobile companion as well for us. So let's start by looking at the architecture we're gonna use to build this application. There's going to be a, a web front end that's written in App Engine that does sort of the heavy lifting. We're gonna do, use a variety of data storage technologies from Cloud SQL to the Cloud Data Store to Cloud Storage. Uh, there's some processing we're gonna do with Compute Engine, and I'll talk about that when we get to it. And then finally, we're gonna build a mobile front end um, using the Android tools to tie the whole thing together. So let's start with the App Engine front end. 
Um, as, as Urs mentioned, App Engine was originally built um, to take away the tedious, error-prone grunt work from making a global scale, highly available application. It's, it's hugely successful with three million active applications. Um, and as Urs mentioned, there's, there's big communities around, PH, uh, around Java and Go and Python, and now we've added PHP to the mix. So we're gonna use PHP to build this particular application. So let's take a look at PHP on App Engine. We'll switch over to the demo machine. And what we have here is a laptop with the Cloud SDK installed. We're gonna use my favorite text editor, in this case, Sublime. And uh, we're gonna start by creating sort of a Hello World application, the simplest PHP application we can think of. So we'll put the PHP tag and we'll do a call to PHP info. Uh, for those of you who don't know PHP, PHP info basically returns a bunch of information about the environment you're running in, the server environment, the configuration, and all that. So it's a one line of code that'll generate some, some interesting comment, uh, content. Now, as, as Urs mentioned, um, we are striving for a 100% compatible version of PHP here. So for, the, for many, many applications, there are absolutely no code changes. But App Engine actually adds extra value on top of PHP. So let's look a little bit at the configuration information that we need to provide for App Engine. Um, some of this is what you'd expect for App Engine, the project ID, the name. Um, those of you who use App Engine know that App Engine provides built-in support for versioning and rollbacks. So you can deploy new versions of an application. Um, if they don't work, you can roll them back um, instantly. So we've, we've given this a version number. We've, uh, we've put index.php as the name of the script that this will run. So with that, we've, we've built our application. Let's flip over to the terminal, and we will publish that app using the uh, standard App Engine tool. We'll tell it that the runtime for this particular language is PH, for this project's PHP, and we'll give it the name of it. And up it goes. So App Engine's collecting the resources, it's compiling the PHP, it's uploading all of that into the application, it checks for the deployment to work, sure enough, and the app is up and running. So let's pop over to the browser and look at this. So here's the PHP info. It has all of the, the information that we would expect that we're running on Linux. Um, it, later on down, it'll list the version of the frameworks that are installed. I'll point out the server API line showing that this is actually running on an App Engine PHP server. So that's a hello world, but now let's actually turn around and build our application. And you know, what's PHP without SQL? Luckily, with the cloud platform, we have Google Cloud SQL. Cloud SQL is a cloud-hosted service that marries the industry standard MySQL front end to a highly available back end, all running on Google-managed, Google-hosted infrastructure. As a developer, I don't have to worry about configuring this MySQL. I don't worry, have to worry about deploying it, maintaining it. I just use industry standard tools like JDBC, Crystal Reports, Squirrel SQL to manage it. So to help get us started, we pre-populated a Cloud SQL database um, with some videos that we took uh, in the week running up to the conference. So let's take a look at that. We're gonna switch over to our command line. We're gonna use the uh, Cloud SQL command tools, and I'm gonna specify the name of the project and the name of the instance of Cloud SQL that I'm running on, and then the particular database I wanna look at. So we connection, and now I can use just standard MySQL type commands. We'll show the tables. Uh, you'll see that there's a table of videos, a table of users. We'll select the first, I don't know, 10 or 50 videos from the videos table. And what I wanna point out here is, um, of course there's an ID. You'll notice that what's stored here is a URL into Google Cloud Storage. We're actually storing these videos in Cloud Storage. Um, so let's actually start to build out the application to query these. Uh, to make it a little bit simpler, we're gonna switch over to the desktop, and I'm gonna drag and drop in a bunch of CSS and HTML and JavaScript to make the, like, to make the uh, application look pretty. And we're gonna look at one uh, particular bit of code, which is the code that queries the MySQL database. If you know PHP, this code should look very, very familiar to you. This is standard PHP MySQL code. Um, the standard connection string and a standard query. But there are advantages of running with Cloud SQL. 
we know that this App Engine app and this Cloud SQL are part of the same project because you told us that. That allows us to automatically configure the firewalls to allow those two to talk to each other while keeping them isolated from other traffic and other, um, other projects that are in, running on the infrastructure. It also allows us to place those instances in our infrastructure in a way that reduces latency between them. Because again, we know that this particular Cloud SQL database and this particular application are, are running with each other. So let's go ahead and run this app. And so now I've got my nice pretty CSS and HTML. We've retrieved from the database the URLs, the thumbnails for all the videos. So we'll just pick one uh, at random there. And we're retrieving the video. And yep, there's Joe waving at us. So um, that's a simple use of querying a Cloud SQL database. Now, this is a video site. And it is 2013, so clearly I have to have comments on a video, right? Um, in fact, I expect this site to be wildly popular. I think I might have thousands of comments for every video, and I have thousands of videos. So clearly I need a very low latency, high performance uh, data store to, to hold those comments. Now, fortunately, we have Cloud Data Store, our built-in NoSQL database. As Urs mentioned, we're currently handling over four and a half trillion requests a month. I think that's enough scalability for, uh, for the comments we are gonna process. So let's take a look at that. If we flip over, um, this is a little bit of code from App Engine that accesses the comments in, cloud, uh, in the cloud data store. Um, you'll notice, uh, again, it looks very familiar to you if you're a PHP developer. It's retrieving a little bit of information from the HTML page, so it's getting the comment. It's retrieving a little bit of information from the session state, so I know the name of the logged in user. It's constructing a comment entity. It's putting in the text, the current date, the user, and then it's calling the put method to actually take that data and store it into Cloud Data Store. Once it's stored, if we scroll down a little bit farther, we'll see the code to retrieve it. Um, it's uh, creating a query for the comments. It's filtering it by the video ID. It's ordering it by the date it was added. And then it's actually taking that and putting it into the HTML page. So we already have some comments we added. So let's flip back over and see what people think of Joe's waving. And uh, they, they seem to like it. Uh, so uh, Brian, what do you think of Joe's wave? Great wave. Great, so when he hits enter, we'll create that, post it into the data store, pull it back, and, and there we have it. So now we have App Engine accessing a very highly available, highly scalable global data store. So if we flip back to the slides for a sec, let me sort of recap what we've done so far. We've built a front end using PHP, uh, the language that powers three quarters of the world's websites. We've accessed data in a variety of forms. We've queried a database in Cloud SQL using just the plain old uh, PHP MySQL integration that I'm used to. Um, I've used cloud storage to access potentially um, terabytes of data that I've stored in actual videos. We've used a, a, a NoSQL database in the cloud data store to store and update comments. So that's a pretty good front end so far. Um, but you know, behind most of the most popular websites out there, there at somewhere there's some heavy duty processing going on. That could be analyzing log files. Uh, it could be building recommendation engines to tell you that if you like A, you might like B. It could be processing uh, media, whether that's audio or video. In our case, we want to allow our users to upload the videos in any format, and we then we want to transcode that to a variety of formats for a variety of devices. Um, that sort of work is a really good uh, for task for compute engine. It's spiky computationally, right? So it only happens when somebody actually uploads a video. It actually is CPU intensive. Um, and so it's the kind of task where I want the cores I want, when I want them, and with the performance I expect. So it's a really good job for Compute Engine. Uh, since the last I.O., we've been very busy hardening the Compute Engine service, uh, rolling out new capabilities for it. So let me give you uh, an update of what Compute Engine looks like. So let's switch back to our cloud console. 
Um, and this is, um, for those of you who are, have noticed already, we've rolled out a new version of the cloud console. Compute Engine now appears in it. I think the, the console looks great. So let's first show you the user interface for creating a new instance. So to create an instance, I, I populate it with all the things you'd expect. I give it a name, a region, I apply metadata to it. Um, if Brian scrolls down, we look at the machine types. Um, we've been busy expanding the range of machine types we offer. So we have everything from one to eight cores, with disks, without disks, high memory, high CPU. So pretty much um, whatever the type of load you have, we've got a machine type there that's suited for it. Now, in our case, uh, we're not going to create VMs with the user interface. We're going to create them programmatically via the REST API because we're going to have App Engine orchestrate these virtual machines. App Engine's going to be the one that creates um, VMs as we need them and kills them when we don't need them anymore. And for everything you do in the Cloud Console, there's a corresponding REST API that lets you do it. So we've got a quick upload page here that we've created. And it's a simple HTML target um, that allows me to drag videos in. Now, we could, drag a, we could drag one video in and watch what happens, but one video, I mean, that's not really Google scale, is it, right? You guys just saw maps of the Earth, so I think you expect a little more than one video. So let's drop 1,000 in. Now, VMs take 20 to 30 seconds to spin up, um, which may seem fast to you, but to us, that's still too slow. Um, so, but while it does that, let me just talk to you about what it's doing. Um, we could have App Engine just fire up one VM and tell it encode 1,000 videos, but that would take a while. What I really want to do is have a fleet of virtual machines that I spread the work out to. And that's exactly what the App Engine app is doing here. It's firing up a, a bank of VMs. It's using our Compute Engine Management APIs to monitor the CPU load. Um, if the CPU loads are all busy, it fires up more VMs so the job gets done quickly. If the CPU load drops, it gives that VM more jobs to do. When it's finally done, it goes through and it shuts down all the VPMs, v, excuse me, VMs so that I don't pay for the usage anymore. And this is a good example of why fast startup and sub-hour billing is so cool. I can literally throw cores at a problem because the VM start up quickly, they do the work, and I only pay for the minutes that I'm actually running them. Um, so I think we've, by this time we should have some VMs up and running. So let's pop back over to the console, and you'll notice down there, there's the list of our VMs. They're in alphabetical order, not the order we instantiated them. So if we scroll down, yeah, you see the green check marks. Those are VMs that are up and running and are processing work now. Um, and if you scroll back up to the graph, You'll see that we ran an earlier test run um, a little bit earlier, and you can see the CPU spikes from those um, jumping up. And more importantly, you see them going back to zero, right, when the work was done. You know, at Google, we say faster is better, and we certainly take that to heart in Compute Engine by having fast startup times, consistent performance, and sub-hour billing, really letting you do things that are economically, that weren't even economically possible before. So let me go back to the slides for a sec. Recap where we are with our application. We've got a front end written in App Engine and PHP that handles all the website. We've got a, a variety of data stores in Cloud Storage, Cloud SQL, Cloud Data Store. And we have a back end in Compute Engine that uh, does video encoding for us. But there's more we can do with Compute Engine here. Um, remember I talked about those comments that we've had in the Cloud Data Store. Um, well, I'd, as the owner of this site, I'd like to actually know whether on balance those comments were good, bad, or neutral. Um, and furthermore, I want to use Compute Engine to do that analysis. Now in the past, the cloud data store was only available to App Engine. But as of today, that data store is open to everybody so that I can access the same comments data that App Engine was, was using from Compute Engine. The nice thing about the data store, it was developed for the kind of data sets that we encounter at Google. As we do things like web search and maps and ads and Gmail, we needed a very high capacity data store that had very fast performance. So you get consistent performance on this data store whether you're accessing a megabyte of data or a terabyte of data. So let's flip over um, and um, look at how we're gonna do this. We wrote a Python script that analyzes the comments. 
Um, we'll take a quick look. So we're going to um, SSH into that machine. So why don't we go back to the text editor real quick so we can show the code. Um, so this is, does some very simple analysis based on the words that are included in the post to find out whether it's net positive or negative. Um, if we scroll down a bit, we'll see the code to query the database. So there's query response equals database.run query um, that uh, retrieves the data. And then there's some similar code that writes the data. You notice it says data store.blind write. In this case, we're the only ones accessing the data store. So a blind write is just fine, right? I don't have to worry about uh, multiple writers. If I did care about that, I could just as easily wrap this up in a transaction and get that, that transacted protection as well as, um, uh, as well as this way. So this is our simple, simple video or comment analysis. Let's go back and actually run it on one video to see what it does for one video. So we're SSH'd into our virtual machine and we're gonna run this Python script, and it retrieves all the comments very, very quickly. Um, for each, one, each comment, it determines zero is neutral, one is positive, minus one is negative. Now, that's fine for one video, but I've got a 1,000 videos, and I have a 1,000 comments on each video. So this starts to look like a map reduce sort of job, doesn't it, right? Phase one being analyzing all the comments, Phase two being to collect that information and come up with an aggregate answer of whether a video is good or bad. So we already have a 10 node a Hadoop cluster up and running on Compute Engine. And just to prove that this, um, yeah, just to prove that this really is writing to the data store, let me flip over to the data store viewer in the cloud console and, I, and we'll look at the comments database, or the comments data store. So we've got a query we've written. So just to see, these are all the IDs of the videos and the number of comments they have. And you'll notice there's no column there for, for a sentiment. We haven't yet calculated that. In fact, because this is a NoSQL database, we don't even have a schema for, for columns. In fact, if I were using a SQL database, this would be really difficult because I would have to push a schema change through the whole system just to start calculating sentiments. The nice thing about NoSQL databases is you just start writing new values and they automatically appear. So let's fire up the Hadoop job and let's start processing these for all of the videos. Now, as Urs mentioned, uh, we run a lot of MapReduce inside of Google. So we've really tried to optimize our data center to run MapReduce jobs really well. So our job is running the, the map phase for each, each video. It retrieves all the comments. It does a quick analysis on whether it's positive, negative, or neutral. The reduce phase then collects those results for all the videos and comes up with an answer for each one. So the map is, is done, uh, the reduce is started, so let's flip back to the console and, and rerun the query. And you'll notice we have total sentiments now calculated. It's a new column that appeared. We've calculated all that. Um, some of them look awesome. Some videos got a 31. Um, some of them, maybe not so much. I hope Joe's the 31 and not the minus four. So sure enough, the values are calculated and they appear in the data store. So if we go and look at, uh, the last thing we did was we updated our PHP page to actually retrieve that value that was calculated. So if you scroll down, you'll see it's now positive. So here we had App Engine entering comments in the data store, Compute Engine reading those values, writing a sentiment value back, and then App Engine seeing that sentiment and placing it um, in, the, in the page. So you really get to use each service for the job it's best at, but have a consistent set of data stores that you can access across all of those. So let's flip back to the slides. So that completes our web app. So let's turn our attention to the mobile companion. You know, we're all walking around with incredibly powerful video devices in our pockets, so of course we want to be able to take video and upload them. And in fact, I what I really want to do is make it super easy for my mobile developers to access the code that I've written inside of App Engine. And Cloud Endpoints does that. Cloud Endpoints makes it super simple to write backend logic in whatever language you want and easily expose a nice, friendly client-side interface. You don't have to worry about data serialization. You don't have to write OAuth code. You simply write server code, and then you get a nice client library for it. 
So to do that, we've written some back-end code in Java, uh, taking advantage of the feature that Urs talked about of, build, of breaking App Engine apps into subcomponents. We've written a second component in Java. We need to switch the switcher. Um, this uh, component does two things. First, it returns a URL into cloud storage for the mobile device to upload to. Second, it provides an API here you see called Upload Completed that the mobile device will call when the video's uploaded. And when that's done, the App Engine server sets a title, creates a thumbnail, basically populates the metadata about that video. So I'm, I'm pretty happy that does what I want. Now, those of you who've noticed uh, will notice that we're not in Sublime anymore. This is the new Android Studio mobile IDE that you heard announced earlier today. Uh, based on IntelliJ, um, I think it's a huge step forward in terms of providing a great development environment for Android. Now, I'm a cloud guy, so my particular favorite feature here is this. I can right-click on my server project, and down there there's cloud endpoints, and it says generate client libraries. That's all I need to do. The tool will then generate for me a client-side wrapper that gives me a nice, clean, type-safe interface to my server-side logic. So let's look at that uh, client-side code. And you'll notice this code looks uh, very much like the server-side code. There's upload completed. It takes a bunch of parameters for a URL and a thumbnail and a string. So by calling that, I don't have to deal with the authentication. I don't have to worry about how do I serialize and marshal data back and forth between the client and the server. So we're actually going to run this application now. I've got an Android phone here. So if we switch over to this. Hello. Is the phone dead? The phone turned off. You rehearse for almost every eventuality in these things, but somehow the phone being turned off was not one of them. While that's coming up, let me mention a couple things. Um, there are breakout sessions on all the topics that we're covering today, including mobile development with the backend starter, PHP on App Engine, there's a complete breakout session on that. There's a breakout session on the cloud data store as well. So if you want um, the nitty gritty from the developers on any of those technologies, definitely the, those breakout sessions are where to go. I don't have my phone here. Toss me my phone from my bag. I have the app on it. So we'll take one more time for that to boot. I'm gonna go through this because it's worth seeing the mobile device. There we go. Here we are. Unfortunately, I'm about to expose Brian's, excuse me, Brian's uh, unlock code. So if you happen to get his phone, you now know how to do all sorts of things. So here's our application. It's staring up at the Elmo. I'm gonna put my head in it. I'm gonna hit the record button. You'll see it starts recording. You'll see the blue recording bar going across. Okay, it's finished recording. Connecting server for URL. So it's making the first call. Could not upload your video. Let's try it one more time. Yep.
Ah, yes, now we have connection. Let's see how Verizon does. There we go. So it's recording now. Connecting the server. Uploading the video. Yes. Persistence pays off. Uh, I'm gonna do one more of you guys just so that you're memorialized in my keynote demo for the time when my phone didn't work of all things. So I'm taking a video now, everybody can wave. Very nice. And it's gonna do its thing con connecting to the server, uploading the video. Let's flip back to the actual site. Let's look at the videos. The most recent one uploaded is Yes, me looking, unfortunately, right up my nose. So that's, <laughs> if my parents are watching, I apologize now. So let me, oh, there we go, that's a better one. Let's go back to slides. So that's really just one example of, of what you can do with uh, the cloud platform. I want to point out uh, one more that, uh, that I'm not going to build, but I want to draw your attention to, and this is the data sensing lab. Um, those of you who've noticed um, have seen these little signs around Moscone Center. We've deployed 525 sensors around Moscone that measure things such as the temperature and the humidity and sensor mats of how many people are walking by and the, the noise level, how loud is it. And then we've built a system uh, using the cloud platform to collect that data, to store that data, to analyze it, and to visualize it. So if you go to the sandbox um, after, right now after this session, you'll be able to see this data in real time and sort of play with and visualize a very large, very rich set of data. Um, well, there's also going to be a session um, where the authors of the data sensing lab will walk you through what they did, how they did it, and how they used the cloud platform. While you're at the sandbox, um, you know, please take the time to stop by and look at our partners. Um, as you know, even as much effort as we put into the cloud platform, it's not just us, it's also our partners that help make this real. Uh, in particular, there are 16 partners who will be in our sand... Somebody double-click the button. There'll be 16 partners at the, in the sandbox. These aren't marketing people, these are developers. So you can go and ask your technical questions. They'll tell you their best practices they learned from running um, on the cloud platform. Um, and so that's a great resource as well. With that, um, we'll turn it back over to Urs, and I'll wish everybody have a great I.O. Thank you, Greg. So, um, You've heard a lot today and saw a lot of uh, cool new things. Uh, just to recap, you've seen um, the cloud data store in action in the demos and uh, accessible now from, from anywhere. You have sub-hour billing, so you pay only for what you actually use. You have shared cord instances for the times where you just need a, a little bit of CPU. You have advanced routing to connect on-premise and off-premise. You have uh, 10 times larger persistent disks, and you have PHP on App Engine. But there's one more thing I like to talk about it. And in fact, it's something that I wish we had had in 1999 when we started Google. And it's something that we've been working on for a very long time. And it's something that's just a start but something that I believe will change the face of computing over the next decade based on the work that we've done in the past decade. Something that will make Google better, but will make the life of developers better, and it will make the web better. So I'm very, very excited that tonight, starting at 6 p.m., Compute Engine is open for signups to everyone. So, yes. so uh, head over to cloud.google.com, uh, sign up, uh, give it a spin. I'm excited to see what all of you do on top of this platform. So thank you for coming to Google I.O. Thanks for coming to the cloud session. Have fun at the other sessions, and have fun in San Francisco. <laughs>